Hello and welcome to another episode of Full Court Finance here at Zacks. I'm your host, Ben Rains. And today we're looking at five top ranked stocks that might be worth buying despite some more pullback fears. But before we get into everything, I want to say remember to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts and make sure to check out our new zacks.com slash promo page for a look in some of our services, portfolios, and more. All right, so we're going to do a quick little market recap before we dive into these five stocks just to give people a better sense of the context for all of the five stocks we're going to talk about. So the market jumped Monday morning as big daily swings seem to return to the market over the last week or so. The tech-heavy Nasdaq now sits about 8% off its September 2nd highs after it fell into correction territory in just three days. Uh, analysts and investors really had been calling for a pullback for months now with the tech-driven market rally up huge. In August, it continued even higher. So we could see some more selling from some big coronavirus standouts such as Tesla. With that said, investors with a longer-term horizon don't really need to try to time the market so precisely. In fact, trying to time the market can often lead to buying high and selling low. So if you're looking for those consistent gains when you're moving in and out of stocks, it's really those are more reserved for those experienced traders. So it's always better if unless you're glued in completely to the markets and you're very confident, it's always better to have a longer term investment horizon. So even if you see some near term pullback, the longer you stay in the stock, the more likely you are <clears throat> to succeed in the long run. Just that's the, the basic premise of longer hurt, longer term buy and hold investing. Uh, so with this in mind, it's it's never a bad time to look into stocks, especially with this correction. Uh, with that said, we could we could see some more turmoil in the near term, especially uh, with some volatility around surrounding the uncertainty of the upcoming U.S. election. But with that said, the institutional investors and the real movers and shakers of the stock market have to find a return somewhere. So they're not selling big tech outright. They're just taking some profits and with interest rates pinned at near zero for the foreseeable future equity markets could continue to benefit as not fighting the Fed and that Tina phrase, which is, there is no alternative. They are all very real. So even with the volatility and there could be some near-term selling, the environment with the interest rates creates the ability for stocks to continue to climb. Two things move stock prices in the long run, earnings and interest rates. Interest rates are near zero and earnings are expected to return to growth in 2021 as they trend in the right direction in Q3 and Q4. So with all of this in mind, we're going to dive into five highly ranked stocks that investors might want to consider buying within uh, the near future. So we're going to start with Target. It's trades on the ticker TGT. The firm, like nearly every other retailer and its big rival, Walmart, has boosted its e-commerce and direct-to-consumer business. This has all happened, and that's the narrative you'll continue to hear. And it it does really hold water that Amazon's success and its massive expansion plans over the last five years helped spur these other traditional retailers to really push more quickly into e-commerce and delivery. And all of this helped them prepare uh, for the coronavirus, and they really have shined during these conditions. So. Target's expanding portfolio of same-day offerings includes in-store pickup, its drive-up service, its subscription-style ship-it unit, and these various options have proved very helpful during the pandemic. So if we look back, its Q1 sales were up over 11%, and then its Q2 sales climbed excuse me, 25% in the second quarter. So 11% in the first quarter, 25% in the second quarter. It's Q2 comps climbed by a company record 24.3% with digital comps up 200%. Uh, on top of that, it posted one of its strongest quarters of in-store comparable sales growth on record up 11%, uh, which is pretty interesting considering that most people would probably just think that not they wouldn't do such great in-store business given the coronavirus conditions and this social distancing push, but 
clearly the big box retailers like Target and Walmart are able to not only benefit from their increased digital business, but also their in-store focus as well. Target also saw its operating margins climb to 10% up from 7% in the year ago quarter. That comes in well above Walmart and Amazon, which helps Target look more attractive compared to both of those stocks maybe in the long run as Amazon's running those razor thin margins. But that massive growth is what everyone is looking for on Amazon. Uh, We should also note that despite near perfect conditions for e-commerce retail to thrive, it only accounted for 16% of total U.S. retail sales in the second quarter. And this is based on U.S. Census Bureau data, which was up significantly from about 12% in the first quarter and about 11% in the year-ago period. Yet many, including myself, might have expected that figure to be even higher than 16%, considering that the second quarter was the near-perfect conditions for e-commerce to thrive. So Target has the ability to grow during the continued expansion of e-commerce, which has a lot more room of for runway than maybe some people thought. And clearly, brick-and-mortar retail is not dead. It's just specific brick and mortar retailers are finding it hard to succeed. We should also note that Target's been able to keep and attract younger customers, unlike department stores such as Macy's. And this is through trendy and affordable lines of furniture, home decor, fashion. They also have their own flagship uh, grocery brand, their newest grocery brand, which is now they're going to be their their flagship in-store brand is that good and gathered. So if you ever see that, that's their flagship brand in stores. And that's seen some strong momentum since it launched in September of 2019. So a year ago, uh, with this in mind, the stock is up about 15% in 2020 and 25% in the last three months. Uh, this is part of a much larger climb that's seen it soar the last three years. It's outpaced Walmart. And we should note that it hasn't really been impacted by the recent sell-off with its shares only down slightly from its August highs. So despite the climb, uh, Target is trading at a discount as it has for years to its broader industry and its peer group, which includes the likes of Costco and Dollar General and others. So it's trading at about 20 times forward earnings at the moment compared to its peer groups, average of about 26 times forward earnings. And on top of that, we should note that Target announced in early June that it raised its quarterly dividend by about 3% to $68 per share. Its current yield is coming in at about 1.84%. This tops Walmart and the S&P 500's average. And it looks even better considering the interest rate environment we just talked about. Uh, So if we look ahead, our Zax estimates are calling for its Q3 earnings to jump about 10% 10% on 10% stronger sales. So the continuation of impressive growth. And overall, we're expecting its adjusted earnings to climb 12% in 2020 on 12.4% stronger revenue. And since its August 19th release, its longer-term earnings estimates are up big. Its 2020 estimates up 44%. And it's 2021 estimates up about 15%. This positivity helps Target grab a Zach's rank number one strong buy at the moment. We should also note that it holds an A grade for growth uh, in our style score system. And it's part of an industry that sits in about the top 30% over more than 250 Zach's industries. So Target clearly seems to be a retail stock that has longer term growth possibilities and uh, pays a solid dividend. So it's certainly worth considering as a longer term investment as it's able to grow, not only during the coronavirus, but for years and years to come in the future. And now we're going to move on to maybe the biggest name of the coronavirus market, and that is Zoom Video, trades under the ticker ZM. And the stock in general, besides the, the pullback recently, has continued to prove the naysayers wrong throughout the last six months or so. This was highlighted by a 40% surge following its second quarter earnings, which we've seen a pullback since then. But as the economy returns to something more close to normal, uh, as we are at the moment, uh, there are questions about Zoom's longer term strength. And those might grow louder 
for the reason that as people go back to work, maybe there's less need for this video conferencing platform. But we should note that the company was expanding well before the pandemic, and this pandemic has highlighted the utility of its offering. And I think that it really could be a nice long-term investment as well. So Zoom was thrust in the spotlight early on in the pandemic. This was as people and businesses quickly searched for ways uh, to connect with coworkers and friends during this stay-at-home and social distancing push. And Zoom's cloud-based video conferencing platform proved to be a hit for its ease of use, and it pro proliferated pretty quickly through the early days of the coronavirus uh, and even if, I mean, I know this is the case for my friends and family that those Zoom calls have slowed down and that could continue to fade as people expand their circles. Uh, it doesn't really matter I, because Zoom is making its money from those business, those paying business clients uh, who are continuing to use that as a lot of offices, especially in big cities are continuing to work remotely. And it's. we should also note that those schools are still working or learning remotely. This is all the way from kindergarten and up to college who are using Zoom and that could continue for the foreseeable future. And this is a point I've made before when I've talked about Zoom on this show is that the current work remote environment in big cities could last longer than some people assume just because the issue of public transportation and elevators continues to hamper large reopening programs because driving uh, to work in these big cities like New York and Chicago and uh, San Francisco becomes a little harder, but specifically in cities where public transportation is a big thing. And then maybe more importantly, in terms of Zoom's longer term success, companies that find this work from home environment relatively seamless might permanently cut back on rent and other commercial real estate expenses. We've seen that the numbers are showing that people are already leaving San Francisco as companies like Facebook and others in Silicon Valley commit to a longer scale and longer term remote working plan. So uh, that that's certainly the ability. And then Zoom also offers companies the chance to scale down on travel costs, which the pandemic could help to normalize. Who knows if that will be the case. But even before the pandemic, Zoom was highlighting their ability to help businesses in Silicon Valley and other places cut down on their environmental impact. This is something that a lot of companies, for whatever reason, might like to tout to investors and consumers. So cutting back long term on their carbon footprints. And then, as we mentioned, just more and more people might be working from home and going to school remotely for much longer than people assume. And we could go back over their their stats, but we won't need to go over Q1 or anything. I'm going to scroll down a little bit farther. So if we look at their most recent results, which came out on August 31st, it's Q2 fiscal 2021 results. Uh, it was still able to impress investors despite that massive stock price movement. So the company's revenue climbed 355% in Q2 with its customers who had over 10 employees jumped 460% to about 370,000. And then this is that key figure of clients bringing in over $100,000 in trailing 12 month revenue jumped 112% for that three month period and ended on July 31st. This helped Zoom crush our bottom line estimates with uh, its adjusted earnings climbing from $0.08 cents per share in the year-go period all the way to $0.92 cents per share. And it's seen a bunch of bottom-line positivity since then. It's consensus estimates up 114% for Q3, up about 80% for its current fiscal year, and another 65% for fiscal 2021, or 2022 for Zoom. Uh, so we're calling for <clears throat> another massive quarter in Q3. The stock currently holds a Zacks rank number one strong buy at the moment. It also holds an A grade for growth in our style score system. 
and it's topped our bottom line estimates by at least 100% in the trailing four quarters. And analysts seem to continue to struggle to keep up with their massive growth. With that said, there clearly could be more selling pressure on the market, these big tech stocks. Zoom's valuation certainly screams growth at the moment. So maybe some investors want to wait for the dust to settle a little bit more. With that said, uh, Zoom has clearly established itself as a pandemic winner that could thrive as some businesses at least kind of maybe permanently adopt some of these new habits that they've picked up during the coronavirus. And the stock rests already about 13% off its recent highs. And this has this includes it bouncing back since it fell as much as about 20% in just a few sessions. So it's sitting currently uh, through early morning trading Monday at about 13% off its recent highs. And now we're going to move on to a totally different stock, but another highly ranked stock that has some longer term growth abilities ahead of it. That is the Boston Beer Company, which trades under the ticker SAM, so S A M. The firm was one of the founding fathers of the commercialization of craft beer. It's seen its stock price soar recently. And it's now currently a lot of that growth in the last year and during 2020, especially has come as it rides out the next revolution in alcoholic beverages. And that is hard seltzer. So it is the owner of truly hard seltzer, which launched in April of 2016. It's currently the number two player in that booming hard seltzer market behind only white claw. And it's well ahead of new entrants. Everyone is jumping into the hard seltzer market, Bud Anheuser-Busch. So you have Bud Light Seltzer, there's Coors Light Seltzer, there's Corona Seltzer. You even have Coca-Cola is ready to jump into the hard seltzer market with a offering that's not Coke branded, but it's a, a Coke company. So that's a booming market. The company's founder has called hard seltzer a once in a generation type thing. It's it's the new light beer, how that was. Uh, and the sales numbers back that up. So the firm's Q1 sales jumped 31% with second quarter revenue up 42%, driven in large part by Truly and its newer Truly Hard Lemonade. So if we look ahead, our Zach's estimates call for its Q3 sales to climb another 36%, with it expected to jump about 34% overall in fiscal 2020 and another 18% in 2021. So we're calling for 34% growth, another 18% growth next year. And this would come on top of 26% growth last year and 15% growth the year before that. So some really big growth for a company that's been around a long time. And a lot of this is coming from this new hard seltzer category. Boston Beer is currently a Zach's rank number one strong buy with an A grade for growth. And its adjusted earnings over this stretch are expected to climb about 30% in 2020 and another 60% in 2021. So some really impressive bottom line growth as well. And despite the fact that the stock is up about 470% over the last three years compared to its industry's 13% decline, it's trading at a discount compared to its industry. So it's trading at about 5.5 times forward sales versus its industry's 16 times forward sales. And it's also trading below its one-year highs, even as its stock price sits not too far off new records. And that's after a brief downturn. Uh, so it didn't, it didn't fall as much as some of the big tech names, but it did, it did get pulled back a little bit amid this market correction recently. So clearly it seems that Sam... Boston beer stock is worth considering. It's both the near-term coronavirus play with alcohol sales continuing to trend upward and as a longer-term investment in what is clearly, at this point, the, the category of the future in the alcoholic beverage market. And now we're going to turn to another stock that is a Zach's rank number one buy at the moment, strong buy at the moment. That is Scott's miracle Grow. It's trades under the ticker SMG. The company... I'm sure a lot of people have heard of it, uh, became famous for its lawn and gardening products. It also owns Ortho. And these days, though, its Hawthorne Gardening Company unit has really helped to drive that growth. And this is that indoor gardening and that hydroponics business. So this provides Scott 
helped Miracle Grow with major exposure to the growing marijuana industry in North America, as well as indoor farming in general, which both have the potential to boom not only over the next few years, but over the next several decades. So if we look back, its revenue climbed by at least 15% for eight quarters in a row. And its most recent results were, so its Q3 fiscal 2020 results, it saw its revenue climb about 28% with that Hawthorne unit. So that's that hydroponics unit up 72%. And the company has also benefited from that increased home improvement spending during the coronavirus. And so if we look ahead, its fourth quarter sales are projected to jump uh, another 60%. And if we look at its adjusted earnings, are expected to climb about 53% for the year on 28% stronger sales. Uh, its positive earnings revisions help it earn exact strength number one strong buy at the moment. Also has an A grade for growth. Uh, the company also announced at the end of July that it approved a special dividend of $5 per share, and it raised its regular dividend by 7%. Both uh, were payable on September 10th. So if you're listening to this, you've already missed out. But I, I, I mentioned, to, and this was to shareholders of record on August 27th, but I mentioned this only to say that that shows the company's strength at the moment and that its management is pretty confident going forward. Its yield currently sits at about 1.5%, so just below the S&P 500's average and well above the uh, 10-year U.S. Treasury at the moment. And this yield is not artificially inflated by a falling stock price whatsoever. So SMG shares are up 50% in 2020 and about 100% in the last two years. And they currently sit about 9% off their 52-week highs at the moment. So that might be enticing to some investors for a company that looks prepared to grow as part of an industry that really could be a growth industry in multiple ways, that marijuana business and the overall indoor farming in general. And we're going to close out with uh, one last stock, and that is Yeti, which trades under the ticker Y-E-T-I. The firm sells high-end coolers, and it has expanded its reach from commercial fishermen to everything from tailgates and campfires to commuters. So the Austin, Texas-based company's portfolio now includes drinkware such as tumblers and mugs and chairs and other various consumer-focused offerings besides those thousand-plus-dollar massive coolers that are geared towards, as I mentioned, commercial fishermen and hunters in the early days. Uh, so, in fact, if we look, 57% of its revenue came from a drinkware unit last quarter. And investors might want to think of Yeti sort of in the same breath or same vein as Lululemon, since they both are companies that are new age, higher end retailers that have built strong brand loyalty in the social media age and are taking on the old guard as they expand internationally as well. So, if we look back, Yeti topped our Q2 revenues. And earnings estimates in early August, sales are up about 7%, which came during an economic downturn for a consumer uh, business. That is always a good sign. And we should also note that its direct-to-consumer business jumped 61%. So this came as a lot of its retailers weren't necessarily those essential retailers that its offerings are in, and people aren't necessarily browsing around uh, shops where Yeti are sold in stores during the pandemic. So that could clearly turn around as people get more used to the current environment. Uh, we should also note that its gross profit jumped uh, 18%. And this was as that higher margin direct to consumer business did so well. It also improved uh, on the cost front with its adjusted earnings about up about 38%. And its outlook appears even better in the second half of the year. So if we look Ahead, our Q3 revenues are calling for its, or our Q3 estimates are calling for its revenues to climb about 13%, with Q4 projected to jump about 15%. So overall, if we look, its fiscal year sales are expected to climb 11% this year, so 2020, and then another 14.3% into 2021 to hit about 1.2 billion, which would mark the continuation of solid growth. And for investors thinking about the growth front, it's always good to see higher growth the year after the current fiscal year. So you're growing even more the next year than you are 
this current year. And then uh, its adjusted earnings outlook is even better over the same stretch. It's expected to climb about 16% this year and then another 21% in FY21. And like with all these companies we mentioned, its bottom line estimates are up big. Recently, this helps uh, it grab a Zach's rank number one strong buy at the moment. Yet he also boasts a strong history of earnings beats, and it's part of a, a highly ranked Zach's industry at the moment. And so with all that said, its shares have soared about 200% since the market's March 23 lows. This outpaces Lululemon. The stock's now up about 65% in the last 12 months and 180% from its fall 2018 IPOs, IPO. And it has cooled off recently, part of a Part of the downturn, it's resting about 13% off its recent highs at around $48 per share. And in the end, the company looks poised to grow its higher margin direct consumer business and expand its reach as part of a, a larger group of these upstart retailers. And we should note that if you're comparing it to some of these upstart retailers, higher end businesses that we mentioned, Lululemon, and I would even throw sort of Peloton in there and some of these other companies that are these new age names. It's trading at a discount to all of them. So it's trading at 34 times forward earnings compared to Lululemon's 56. And that's the same for forward sales. It's trading at 3.8 times or forward sales versus the 8.4 for Lulu and about 8.3 for Peloton. So it's uh, got a more enticing valuation for Yeti as well. So of all these upstart brands, Yeti does seem like it might be worth considering at the moment. And with all these stocks, as I said, there could be more near-term selling. So do whatever makes you feel more comfortable amid all of this. But with interest rates low, longer-term investors should probably be still considering stocks to add to their portfolio at the moment, especially since we already saw this big 10% correction, which might ease some investors' nerves that there's not going to be another maybe massive 10% correction. But as we said, the uncertainty of the election, you never know what's going to happen in the near term. That's why uh, longer term investors might have uh, a better sense of what they want to do at the moment with some of these stocks trading at a discount compared to where they have been. So that does it for another episode of Full Court Finance. Until next time, I'm your host, Ben Rains. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.